Hey guys, we have a sponsor for this episode. It's the Heirloom Roses Company. Heirloom Roses knows that the best roses start with the best roots, which is why they only hand propagate own root roses at their family owned and operated Oregon nursery. With over 900 varieties collected over the past 50 years, Heirloom Roses has all the roses you need to create drama in the garden and in a bouquet. They guarantee a healthy and robust rose every time, thanks to extensive genetic testing and sanitary plant health practices. Plus, Heirloom offers a one-year guarantee. If your rose doesn't survive, they'll replace it for free. Visit heirloomroses.com today and take 20% off your order of roses with the code NERD20, now through October 31st, 2024. Roses grow best when they're allowed to thrive on their own roots, the way nature intended. So use code NERD20, that's N-E-R-D-2-0, and get your own root roses at heirloomroses.com today. Now, on with the show. Welcome everyone to the Garden Nerd Tip of the Week podcast, where experts from around the world talk shop, share stories, and offer their favorite tip. I'm your host, Christy Wilhelmy. This week, we're chatting with Chris Chung of Fluent Garden. Chris has a passion for growing perennial edible plants and designing food forests, or layered gardens, for residential scale properties in Metro Vancouver, Canada. She's been the program coordinator and instructor for the Horticulture Technician Foundation Program through the UBC Botanic Gardens Horticulture Training Program. And she's written a new book, The Layered Edible Garden, A Beginner's Guide to Creating a Productive Food Garden Layer by Layer. Thanks for being here, Chris. Thanks for having me, Christy. Uh, the folks at Cool Springs Press sent me your book and I thought, oh, this is going to be fun. And I think, you know, while we've had permaculture guests on the podcast before, I really like the way that you use concrete examples and language around the concepts of a layered garden. So what drew you to stacking functions and designing layered gardens in the first place? Yeah, I think a few things um, led me to this idea of really trying to simplify um, as you said, like a, a lot of this lingo around permaculture and building guilds. Um, when I was first introduced to permaculture and the term food forest, I was actually designing um, a small scale food gardening course while I was uh, an instructor at UBC Botanical Garden. And my manager at the time, he's like, can you look into this? It's this really hot topic. I think it's worth checking out. And at the time, I had no idea because I was teaching people how to grow in rows, in raised beds, you know, more traditional styles, especially for um, new food growers. And once I started digging into this topic, Christy, I could not stop because yeah. I'm like, this makes so much sense because it allows people to appreciate the plants around their garden. And it really kind of nudges someone into the world of researching different plants that could work for their garden. So there was that element. Um, and also when I was doing consulting work, um, mostly with coaching one-on-one -on -one in Vancouver, a lot of the clients really wanted to build gardens, um, especially for their children. You know, we want, we want an apple tree, we want, you know, blueberries, but how do we do it? I've got limited time. And uh, we've got a small patio. How can we build something that's beautiful and that we can enjoy? So it was mixing bits and pieces of this and realizing that I couldn't really use academic language to try to explain these things. So it was great practice for me to find the right terminology and ways to explain things so that the everyday home gardener could get excited about researching and trying new things and not being afraid of just playing in the garden. So that's really where it came from. And just me being in the garden as well. Yeah. And have you always gardened or did, was this something that, cause you mentioned that you're, you know, we know that you're, you're an educator at a botanic garden. So was gardening always part of your life or did you find it later on? Uh, one of my fondest memories was actually digging up potatoes in my childhood home with my dad. I think everyone has something like that, mm -hmm. um, where whether it's potatoes or tomatoes, it's usually one of those two or lettuce. Right. Um, and I remember that memory, but then there was this whole period of this gap. I can't remember specifics, but I always had access to a garden, which I was, I'm just so grateful for. Um, and it wasn't until, um, 
when my son was born, roughly, oh my gosh, he's almost 10, um, that we had a garden space in our home. And I'm like, you know, this is kind of fun. Let's start growing some neat things outside, just get him outside, appreciating, I know, insects and flowers. And that's really how it all started again. And then shortly afterwards, I decided to uh, formalize my training. And that's when I joined that um, horticulture training at the Botanical Garden. And I'm like, this is this is definitely my jam. I, Yeah. And then that's how I really started to build my garden. Thankfully, we had space and I just kept experimenting. And it really hasn't stopped. Yeah. And I think it's an addiction. You mentioned potatoes because that's certainly for kids, even adults. I mean, it's like digging for buried treasure. So it's this really fun experiment. And then you get food and the math is good because you plant one potato and you get 10. It's awesome. Um, So for those who aren't familiar, what are these layers you speak of? Right. So in the book, we've broken it down into eight layers. And traditionally in food forests, You know, it could be anywhere between like five, usually seven layers, but um, I've decided to pick eight uh, just because some plants fit into some categories better than others. So Mm -hmm. um, we start with the canopy trees. And when designing the garden, I always like to talk about the big pieces first because they kind of dictate the sun and the shade and the overall feel of the space. So there's the canopy trees of These are like the really, really tall trees. For me, it's the tall Douglas firs or the maples. Um, And then underneath, there's the sub canopy trees. And this is where you see a lot more of the fruit tree that you can get at the nursery. So you can include the the pears, the apples, a lot of the common plants, uh, trees that we grow. Shrubs is the next layer down. And this is where you can have a lot of fun. A lot of neat things are found in the nurseries now. Some of my favorites um, are kind of exotic, but they do well where I live. Some need a bit more protection, but it's worth the extra effort. So shrubs is a really great layer. And then the next layer down is herbaceous perennials, which I think you can probably find the greatest variety when it comes to edible things. Um, It could be more grassier things to fill out spots and also flowers. So when growing a garden for food, we like to think about the flowers as well. So this is where a lot of the flowers that come back year after year live. Mm -hmm. Um, Another layer is climbers. And this is really just trying to maximize that vertical space, whether you have an arbor, a simple trellis or an existing tree that doesn't mind something growing up the side of it. It's a really neat layer to explore. Uh, Annuals, although it's not really a layer, it's more of like a category. I like to throw that in there. So this could be the squashes, the nasturtiums, the things that can climb, or you can let them trail. And it kind of bleeds into the other layer, which is ground covers. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's so a lot of these annuals, you know, they grow during this one main season for most areas, um, especially if you get colder temperatures. But yeah, they do like multi-duty, which is great. Um, so with the ground covers, I like focusing on the perennials that just come back year after year with no real issues as long as they're given the right soil conditions. So I'm thinking like the times, the self-heal, um, a lot of the oh strawberries, they're just so beautiful. Um, so ground covers is one of the layers that I really like to focus on, uh, underutilized, but can add so much beauty and yeah. a great impact to the space. And the last layer is the lowest down, which is the rhizosphere or the root crops. A lot of neat ones there, especially if you live in a place that doesn't get freezing temperatures that would kill off the root crops. Yeah. And and you combine all of those things. So given that you're in Canada and it's April, what are you growing up there? Tell us a little bit about your growing space and how you use these layers. So what I've learned over the years is that some plants are more are more sensitive to the frost. So right now, as the, the ground is slowly warming up, we're trying to get the tomatoes ready to go into the ground by June. Um, you know, I'm looking at the space and going, okay, what can I shift around or what stays here? And the 
annual plants are the ones that get shifted around. So they stay in the more raised bed style. Mm -hmm. So right now I'm just making sure that that space is prepped. Um, whereas the perennial garden areas, they kind of just do their own thing. So any fruit trees that I have in the ground, the ground covers are perking back up with the warmer temperatures and also herbaceous perennials. Um, I love anise hyssop and any of the mints, those are waking up. So it's adding some more green to the space. So I'm feeling the energy again, and the I can feel like the garden is waking up. And I do have some perennials that are still in containers. So I'm just trying to plan out new garden bed areas so that they can find their forever home. Yeah. And do you move your containers into the garage over winter? Is that how you deal with it? Yeah. So during the cold snaps of the winter, which did happen um, in the greenhouse is where many of the overwintering perennials, which are a bit more uh, sensitive to the frost and the cold, uh, that's where they hang out. So in containers, usually they're the one gallons, not so much the big ones because they do take up a bit of space. So I do have a carport area, which I like to keep available for stashing plants that need the extra protection, but they don't need the warmer temperatures. So I just put some burlap around them and they are just good waiting there. Nice. And I want to make a point of saying you have a greenhouse. There's so many people here in Southern California who want a greenhouse. I'm like, you don't need one. <laughs> uh, it's just so they're usually really nice to have and kind of a nerdy fun way to engage in gardening. Uh, so are you growing anything year round while you're in there? The first year I had my greenhouse, I got really excited and wanted to grow all the things. And it became a bit overwhelming because mm -hmm. I quickly realized with the size of the greenhouse that I had, it's an eight by 12. So it's a lot of room, but at the same time, once you start packing it, it gets quite cozy. Mm -hmm. I found that once the temperatures started warming up, so right around now, April and into May, it gets warm once the sun's out and things start to cook. Mm -hmm. So the maintenance of growing things year round for me isn't, isn't my thing. So it's mostly a workspace where I start seedlings and um, like March, April, May is when it's packed. So we're going to be seeing lots of uh, green stuff in the greenhouse as we progress through spring. Nice. And um, are you, just one more question about where where you're living, what you have to work with. Is it a regular urban lot or do you have land? What is what are, you, what are you working with there? So I live on a suburban lot. I've got neighbors right like over the fence. Um, usually when I film content, you can't really tell. It's all the camera angles. You, you don't know that there's really a street on the other side of the hedge. There's a school up the street. So... Um, yeah, it's a suburban neighborhood and there is enough land for a whole bunch of beds and enough trees for me to manage. So right now I've got, um, I'd say less than a dozen dwarf trees, but they're still young. So I'm just trying to figure out what I'm going to do once they really grow larger, but it's a good amount of space to work with. And that's where raised beds really help because I can just kind of move them around. They're kind of modular and I'm not really stuck with a permanent spot. Yeah. I think a lot of people think that permaculture, the, you know, the concept of layered gardening uh, is only for folks who have a lot of land or wide open spaces. So since you are in a suburban and urban kind of location, how would someone apply these concepts that you talk about in your book to a smaller space? Yeah. And that's a great question. And uh, we do have a section, like a small section on how to apply this to containers and patios, because uh, where I live in Vancouver is really high density. Most of the people who live here have small patios. If they're lucky, a lot of people have balconies. So you can apply these concepts to growing vertically in a container. So the larger the container, the better. You have to make sure you check with your strata to the, you know, check with the weight limits, make sure you don't, you know, collapse your balcony <laughs> <laughs> because that could be really, really scary. Um, especially once you start growing lots, you know, that soil can get quite heavy. But um, what's really neat with containers is that you're really forced to be creative and you pick the things that you 
know you really want to grow or you know you really want to experiment with. And having that really concentrated layered effect is really beautiful. Um, I've had clients try this out and just see layers of colors. So Scarlet Runner Beans is always like a really favorite climber. It's fast growing. It grows beautifully. It's quite vigorous. And we love hummingbirds. Hummingbirds love the Scarlet Runner Beans. You can have trailing nasturtiums just spill out of a container. And then to anchor the whole container, you can have blueberries or you can have your favorite small fruiting shrub and then maybe some lovage or some perennial herb that grows and fills it out. So I think it could be a really fun space as long as you make sure that the soil conditions and the light conditions um, are all uh, a good fit for the plants. And when we, because you said uh, the larger the pot, the better, what are we talking about? What size? So I would say for a balcony, if you can afford the space, something the size of like a half whiskey barrel, that would be a good size if you can visualize that. Um, I have a couple in my front garden that I've experimented with and I've had one big shrub in the middle. You can have like one or two ground covers that kind of spill over the edge. You can put a very small, even like a bamboo trellis up the backside of it and it works and it's really pretty. It adds like a really great focal point to the garden. Doesn't matter what scale you have. Great. Now I, I noticed in the book that you grow some really interesting crops, or I should say edible things that most people wouldn't think of as edible, like pastas and daylilies, for example. So what are some of your unusual favorites that you like to grow? One of my unusual favorites that I've had in the garden for I'd say three to four years, and it comes, surprisingly, it comes back year after year, is oka. It's this pinkish, or actually it comes in different colors. It's this tuber crop, and you can use it as an underground crop, and it's also a really nice uh, ground cover. So oh. it grows, yeah, it's very beautiful. It looks like... Um, uh, what is it? Grounds, different types of sorrel. It's very okay. tangy. Um, it looks like the weedy sorrel, but it's not quite weedy, especially if you live in a colder climate like mine. I actually have to protect mine uh, once the temperatures drop. But during the fall, it looks really beautiful. It looks like a thick, lush blanket of almost clover. And also depending on the color of the tuber it kind of gives you a hint as to what the stem color is like so mine are this ruby pink color so the stems are kind of ruby pink and then like beautiful little dainty leaves on top and then come winter that's when you dig them up so um, last winter I dug mine up I put them into the greenhouse just so they have like a non like frozen place to hang out and then they leaf out and year after year I propagate them. Sometimes I get a surprise tuber that pushes out new leaves even without protection. So who knows? <laughs> who knows? That's very cool. I've yeah. never grown oka before, but I I know it's a South American uh, you know, kind of standard. And certainly in the parts of southern southern United States, people have grown them. I for some reason thought that it was sort of going to look like how sweet potatoes look when they fill out the canopy or that they were like Jerusalem artichokes and put up some kind of a tall flower. But I love the idea that it's something like sorrel. Interesting. Very cool. All right. So one of the sections of the book that I like uh, where you suggest plants for each layer of the spectrum, trees, shrubs, and vines, and they all have some edible component to them. I'll say for our Southern listeners, while many of these plants are better suited to Northern or colder climates, there are some great suggestions for warmer locations as well. So how should people go about selecting plants for their layered garden? Because I know they have to they have to know a few things. What do you suggest? Right. So where I live and in colder climates, the number one thing, so I'm just going to mention this first, is knowing the coldest temperature that your plant can tolerate. So this past winter, it was very cold and I regretted growing some of the plants that I had because it's a lot of work to protect them. So I'd say if you live in a colder climate, think about that. Can you protect your plants, especially if they're in ground? 
um, and sort of related, you need to know your soil condition. So this is for anyone, not just people in colder climates. You know, what's the soil like? Do you have to keep watering it? Is it a good match for your plant? Um, sometimes when we force plants into conditions that they are just not naturally meant to grow in, it's a lot of work for the gardener and it means a lot more inputs, whether it's amending the soil or just watering and care. So I'd say that's like the number one thing is just understanding your soil. Um, the other piece, which I kind of touched on is management of the plants. Like, let's be realistic. Not everyone <laughs> has the time or the patience or maybe the skill set quite yet to properly maintain the health of a plant. Um, so there's, I mean, it's great because, you know, if you grow a plant that requires you to learn something, then you learn something eventually. But if you are short on time and you can't realistically tend to a plant that needs regular pruning or pest management, take that into consideration. Otherwise, you may end up resenting the plant and that's <laughs> not good. It should be a place um, that you like, your garden. So you choose um, what works for you. And also edible gardens, will you eat the plant? So yeah. I went down that route of uh, growing all sorts of things um, because they're really cool and I like experimenting. But then I realized that I don't end up eating the crops or I just end up giving them away. So I have to think, oh, okay, is this worth the space? Since I don't, I mean, I have space, but I don't have a ton of space. Maybe there's a better alternative. So will you eat it? Um, so I'd say those are some big things that are sometimes the tips that are not shared widely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, it is tip time. Speaking of tips, do you have a favorite tip you'd like to share with the garden nerd audience? I do. I do. And this one isn't specific to a, like this type of gardening, but a very good general one that I always share is if you want to reduce time in the garden, especially around weeding, <laughs> know the life cycle of your weeds, depending on annual weeds or perennial weeds, that changes your priorities. So annual weeds, they have a quick life cycle. They will flower and set thousands of seeds in a short amount of time. You want to tackle those first. Otherwise, you're just starting a cycle of needing to weed the same annual quick growing seeds. The dandelions, the dock, the things that are perennial, lower priority as long as they're not flowering. So save those for a day where you just want to tackle something slowly. I love it. I know that when I see stuff going to seed out there, I start panicking. <laughs> I have to get out there. <laughs> Quick, at least pull the seed heads off. If that's right. all you can get to is just pull the seed heads off at least. All right. Well, thank you so much, Chris, for sharing that and all of your tips here on the Garden Nerd Tip of the Week podcast. Where can people find you online? Well, I'm most active on Instagram. You can find me at fluent.garden. And do you have a website or anything else people should look for? Uh, YouTube is in the works. Okay. Um, I do have a website. It's fluent.garden. There's no www. There's no nothing else. It's just fluent.garden. It's uh, we're revamping it right now. So uh, stay tuned. But if anyone would like to reach me, um, Instagram is probably your best bet. Okay. Thank you so much. All right, garden nerds. You'll find a link to Chris's book this week on gardennerd.com. We'll also share her social media feed and where you can get her guide on where to buy seeds. That's it for this week. Subscribe to this podcast on Apple Podcast or wherever you listen. Visit us for tons of free gardening information at gardennerd.com. Thanks to our sponsor, Heirloom Roses, for supporting this episode. You'll find us on Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter under GardenNerd1, on Facebook as GardenNerd.com, and of course, our GardenNerd YouTube channel. Happy gardening!